Really interesting because last week we talked about suf suffering biblically, the way the Bible means suffering to be. And we were in uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. Let's run through those real quick again. And let's then finish filling out this order. Um, again, we are still in the message, not about us, question mark, not about us, um, would probably be the way I would say it. And um, <laughs> what's interesting is this. As I keep studying on suffering, and that's not what this message is about. This message is, again, whether it's about us or not. Um, I keep running across the, even the references to Jesus' suffering. And people saying, see, Jesus suffered, so should we. You know, the Bible says like Jesus suffered, we suffer too. And I'm like, eh. okay, well, good. God bless you and, and good luck with that. You know, Satan, I'm sure Satan would have fun with that and good luck with that. But truth of the matter is this, before we go into the scriptures, which are going to verify everything I'm saying, say this with me. Jesus suffered, Jesus suffered for, me. for me. Who can I suffer for? <laughs> so when you try to say, I got to suffer like Jesus did, I'm like, but Jesus was suffering for our sins. He, he died on the cross for me that I might have eternal life. What benefit comes from mine? Who could I possibly die for? You can die for somebody in the, in the natural, but it has no eternal value. You can take a bullet for somebody, but it ain't going to save them or you. You might take a bullet for them, then the person turn around and shoot them too, and you're both gone. So me trying to put myself in the place that anything I'm going through is similar to or equivalent to Christ and his walk, is, you can hear how stupid that sounds now, can't you? It's really kind of silly. So it serves no purpose. It doesn't make sense for me to assume that I could add some intrinsic value to the existence of this planet by going through something. If it would, if you gain anything through your experiences, and I'm not even talking about what you call, what the world calls suffering, or the church, I should say, calls suffering. If you gain anything through those experiences, they're yours. Nobody else gains from them. You know, I can share my wisdom with them and maybe help somebody else be encouraged. No, you can't. No, you can't. Because how many of you have raised some kids? How many of you try to share your experience with them? How'd it go? <laughs> you know, they still had to get out there and have their own experiences and come to their own conclusions based on their own understandings. So your suffering did nothing for nobody but you. You get that? So, so we make up this stuff when we don't understand why we're going through what we're going through. Because we need to find something to help us live with the place that we're in. Doesn't make it right. And I'm tired of getting it wrong. I want to figure out the best I can, you know, because can I ever figure out God? No. But the best I can, as far as my life is concerned on this planet, and what I'm called to be on this planet, what I'm here to do. So, when I read, and I start giving you the, the Greek or the Hebrew, it's not to impress you with my, my, my prowess in studying, because it's really not all that good. I, I think I can do that with the word better than I can do with anything else. But, 
it's because it's clear to me, I'm just speaking for me, that my understanding of, of biblical meaning or God's purpose for me has been very flawed throughout my life. Can somebody agree? Amen. You know, I read things in the Word and it promises me things. And then I look at my life and I see it not being there. So then, you know, we do the regular church thing. We go, well, you know, God has a plan. And so now we start devising these plans that God has <laughs> that don't have anything to do with his word. We start making up a plan that's a mysterious plan ooh, that God has that we could never know, you know. And so it becomes this whole non-accountability, push the weight on God, and then stay there. I don't know about you, but I don't like that. That's not good enough for me. So, let's just go over some key points from Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Let us be full of joy now. Let us exhort and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in sufferings, knowing that the pressures and afflictions and the hardships produce patience and that unswerving endurance and endurance fortitude, which develops as maturity of character, approved faith and tried integrity. I'm reading out the Amplified this week. Now, in character of this sort, produces the habit of joyful and confident hope of eternal salvation. So we broke it down last week and we said, so these trials that we're talking about biblically is supposed to produce something. So what's the first thing we say that trial produces what? Pace, thank you. Patience, and patience produces. Well, no, you could do just the regular simple words from the King James that we did last week. Experience, and experience produces hope. So then we know then we're not talking about disease and sickness and, and, and dying and losing your limbs then. Right, we know it. Then we got to understand. Then it's clearly not talking about that. Then, right, because this is an experience that's supposed to produce something that makes you better next time. Let me see if I give it to you in a simple term. Then we'll move forward. When you go to school to study, you submit yourself to what the Bible calls tests or trials of experience or study. And through that study, you find something that's really interesting. And people say this all the time. School book learning versus practical learning is not the same thing because it, it's deficient because it lacks training or practice or character or consistency. Me and Mike went with the young men to play softball. We knew how to swing a bat. We didn't know how to swing a bat correctly. We, learn in, we can learn in class or anywhere or watch somebody on TV and figure you put the bat up and you swing it. But when we realized we weren't hitting any balls, we realized some adjustments needed to be made outside of what was going on in our head to something that needed to happen physically for that to work. So I saw them put the shoulder up. So I said to Mike, Mike, I put the shoulder up. It worked. So Mike put the shoulder up, and we whacking balls all over the place. The sh I don't know what made the shoulder up make the difference, but it made the difference. And we 
were able to participate and not be the, the old guys getting up on the bat, swinging and striking out every time. Now, watch this. You can't get that in the classroom. You can get fundamentals, but then you got to put your theory to the test and swing and miss and keep adjusting how high and low you want to get that elbow until you get this right. Now, wait a minute. That was part one of it. Part two of it is we had to wear some muscles out. You understand what I'm saying? The, the, fun, the fun thing is it was exciting that we were now hitting balls, but now we got to run the bases. <laughs> See, so the, the good part of striking out is I have to do the running. So now with that blessing of now being able to hit the ball comes the responsibility of having to run the base. Are you listening? And all of that, at the end of the day, we were, we were like, oh, oh, because, it, and we played for four hours. So, I mean, you know, it was real. Dominicans love some baseball. And we was rolling with the Dominicans. We was playing. And nobody, and people getting hit in their arms and legs and still playing. Now, but that still for us was a test of ability, learning, endurance. Are you listening? We're just talking baseball. Right, right, right. We're just talking baseball. We're not talking about success in life. We're not talking about coming together. There's a way to knock the devil out. And if you got to get the elbow up to do it, then that's the way you got to do it. But if you keep doing that same and it ain't working, then you need to find out what's wrong with your stance so that you're delivering correctly. Come on now. But the church want to keep saying, no, just keep, just, you just got to stand. Just got to believe. You know, when the Lord's ready, he'll make it happen. Oh, you know, it's all about God's timing. The Lord work in mysterious ways. And none of that's making an adjustment to be successful at what you do. So after I got the ball hit, I had to run. Well, after I connect with Satan, I might need to stomp him. I don't know, but I need to learn these things. Are you with me? So this is not about how good you deal with disaster. This is about you learning the process of success. Say, there is a process to success. Say, there is a God-ordained process to success. Go with me now to James chapter 1. The book of James. Rhonda and Michael James. <laughs> I don't, you, you didn't write it, do I? <laughs> we think it would be very different if you did it. <laughs> They're going to the book of James. And I'm going to bring it home further. Consider it holy joy for my brethren whenever you are enveloped in or encounter trials and fall into various temptations of any sort. So now we know we're talking about the same thing then, right? Be assured and understand that the trying of your faith will bring out endurance. Here we have it again. And steadfast patience. Here we have it again. And then it goes on to say, but let endurance and steadfast patience have a full play and do a thorough work so that you may be a people perfect, fully developed, with no defects, lacking in nothing. So we're talking about the same thing then, aren't we? We're talking about these are trials and conditions that are designed to develop something in you to make you perfect. The goal of it is to make you perfect. God bless anybody who's gone through cancer and survived, but I don't see anything in here that it says so that you can be a survivor. It says that you can be perfect and entire and lack nothing. It, 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 there's an outcome 
that comes from the trials that God is talking about that has a very clear distinction to the ending of it. So if I ask each one of you in the room, which I'm not going to do, something that you went through and as the end of it, you were more educated, you were better skilled, and you were more successful from that time on when you had to deal with that, I'm sure everybody can say, yeah, I can think of something, right? This, this is what the Bible's talking about when it's talking about the trials. I'm going to prove it out. So we're clear here that we're talking about trials, endurance, I just want to add this next verse before I move on. It says this. If any of you are deficient in wisdom, let him ask God who gives to everyone liberally and ungrudgingly without reproach or fault finding, and it will be given to him. Only it must be in. Only it must be in. Now, why is that important? Because we just read that when you take this stand in Romans, it develops character, it develops steadfastness, and then that character develops hope. I've got it out of order, but you got it. The ultimate goal was to bring you to a place of hope, right? Now, we already know that faith is the substance of things hoped for. So we're now introducing the next ingredient then for victory. Please pay attention to Pastor today because you're going to walk out of here changed. Say, I will. Leave here today changed forever. So watch this now. We already saw the steps to getting you to having a steadfast hope. Well, we discussed last week that steadfast hope is important because faith is the substance of things hoped for. And we have confused it a lot of times in the church that the faith is the key. You know, you got to have faith. You got to believe in faith. A faith got to have faith. Baby, you got to have faith. You got to have strong faith, mighty faith, powerful faith. And, and it's not biblically true. Because if you got super strong faith, what good is it if you have no hope? If faith gives substance to what you're hoping for, then why is the emphasis on the faith? Church people get mad when I say this. I've had people try to shout me down on this. But let me give you the, let me give you the proof right here from Jesus' mouth. For verily I say unto you, if you got faith the size of a mustard seed, you can speak to a mountain and say, be thou removed. So obviously the size of the faith wasn't the issue if it could be the size of a mustard seed. It's the lack of hope that's not producing anything. So great faith in nothing. That's like me saying, I just bought the biggest tow chain in the world. And I'm pulling on it. My faith is big. And I got the muscles to pull it. And I say to you, and what's at the end of the chain? What you pulling? You just pulled it all the way to you and I just see an empty hook. You getting this now? So, okay, great, you got a great chain, but what are you pulling? I believe God will make a way. That ain't nothing. You ain't say nothing. What are you hoping for? Where is, your, what is, what is that chain attached? And, and Jesus said, you don't even need a big chain. You can get a thin string if you got the right hope at the end of it. You can pull it in with that. You getting this now? So, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. In plain English, faith gives substance to things that you're hoping for. Say, faith only brings the past that which I'm hoping for. So if I could give you a, a, a real simple illustration, faith is the fishing line to bring in the whale out of the spirit realm. You toss it up there, and you believe for the bite, and when you get that tug, you rail it in. Now, how many of you watch the fishing shows? You see them catch them big 800-pound sharks? They ain't using chain. It's still a fishing line. It's still a line. 
It's still a fiberglass wire. Are you getting this? So it's not the size of the cable. But if you're fishing for shock, you chum different than if you're fishing for bass. There's processes they, that they, they, they do that's a little different. They don't just throw a line in the water with a worm on it and want to catch a tuna. A 400, 500, 800 pound tuna. I always thought when I saw the commercial with Star Kids that fish, Charlie was a little fish. When I finally saw what a real tuna looks like, I was blown away. Have you seen any of them shows? Guy was trying to reach down in the water and pull the fish up, and he flapped his fin and broke the guy's arm. We're talking 800 pounds, 1,000 pounds. That's a big fish. Now, I watched their process of catching the fish. What they did with the water around the boat and everything and how they had to, and I'm like, and I went fishing with a couple of fluke, but they had, their, they had their tuna lines on the side. And when they saw tunas popping up, they said, up, oh, get the tuna lines, and they got the bigger reels to catch these tunas. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole lesson on catching tuna. Here's my point. They knew the process that it took to bring into their boat the bigger fish. And it wasn't necessarily a bigger line, but it was skill to understand the process. And it's a trial because when I'm, I didn't go near the tuna lines because I understood that one wrong mistake, one area where I let too much slack get in the line, the line would be popped. There has to be a consistent tension. And if the fish starts coming towards you and you see that line bowing, you better real fast. Because if they let a little bow do this and they do that, your line is gone and your tuna is gone. So you got to grab that sucker and they are reeling it and reeling it and sweating. <laughs> and trying, oh, it's getting loose. Don't let it tangle. Don't let the lines cross. Oh, my God. And I'm watching. I'm like, oh, that's too much. I just go to the sushi bar. That's just too much. <laughs> it's a lot of work. By the time they get that fish in the boat, they got to make sure they don't br the fish don't break their arm. They don't break their, you know, break their equipment. And it's a lot of work. And I said, in the scripture, it talks about these, in Romans 5, about these, these tests building endurance, which is building character, which strengthens your hope. Because your hope, hope is what you're going, you're using to go for. Faith is just a line. It's just a line. It's just a line. It's a line between here and the spirit realm that pulls that thing in. It's just a line. So Jesus can say things like faith the size of a mustard seed. Don't make a big deal about that. What's your hope? Are you getting this? Now. How many of you say it right now? Shoot, I've been, I've been praying the wrong way. God, give me more faith. God, give me more faith. You don't need more faith. What are you believing for? What's your hoping? You know, you don't even need more hope, big sis. You need hope, a defined hope. And that hope is built through character. It, that defined hope, that hope that maketh not ashamed, the scripture said, is built in character. That's something you practiced, you stood on, you worked in, that you see it that way and you don't see it no other way. You get to the place that you see it no matter what. Hmm. Hmm. So verse 6 again, so let endurance and steadfast and patience have full play and do a thorough work that you may be perfectly entire, lacking none. Then goes on, if any of you lack wisdom, we did that. So verse 6, only it must be in faith that you're asking without wavering, hesitating, or doubt. And this is what people say, you got to have bigger faith. Watch this though. For 
The one who wavers is like the wave of the surge of sea driven with the wind and tossed thither by the wind. For truly not that person imagined that they would receive anything from the Lord. For he or she, being a person of two minds or double-minded, and watch how it describes it, hesitating, dubious, and irresolute. He is unstable and, unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything he or she thinks, feels, or decides. I'm going to read this again. We're talking about hope now, solid hope. For he or she, being a person of two minds, is hesitating, dubious, irresolute. They're not, they not resolved on anything. Let me, let me tell you what an irresolute Christian is. An irresolute Christian is a person, I know God told me to do this. I know it's the Lord. I don't care what nobody say. I know Jesus told me, blah, 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 blah. And then pressure hits. And then it ain't going the way they thought. Or they ain't got that elbow up right when they swinging at that ball. And they keep missing. And then you talk to them a few months later and here's what they say. Now you can smile if it's you and put your head down if you don't want to acknowledge it. But here's what you say. You know, maybe it wasn't the Lord. You know, maybe the Lord just wanted me to try it so I could see that I didn't really want it. See, that's when you start to find out what real believers are. That when it shows you that you have no resolution. You have no real commitment to what you stepped out on. That's why it didn't work. Not maybe God wasn't. Not maybe God ain't in it. You never had a resolution about it in your spirit. Your faith it, it, it had nothing to attach to because your hope had not become consistent and solid. So it'll, it'll, it'll flounder on you. So now you got your hook in the water, but it's empty. You still talking about having faith, but you don't have nothing to connect it to. There's no hope. So you tug in the line for years, but nothing on the other side of it. How many of you tired of pulling that line in the boat and ain't nothing on it? I'm telling you why. I have to stand before the Lord that my conviction, no matter what is, you said I'm going to do this thing, then I'm going to stand here and do it. I know. And that doesn't come from sitting there and, 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 and trying to make yourself believe. That comes from spending time in the word, in the presence of the Lord, too, that that thing is so solid to you that you can't see it no other way, even when everybody else can't see it at all. That's a process. That's a practice. But That's a trial. That's a test. That's, that's the testing of your faith. You got it? When I go to the gym Tuesday morning at 7 o'clock, my trainer's going to put some weight on the bar, and he's going to say, warm up. And I know that means, because I'm about to hurt you. Come on. I'm going to make you do a little more than you did last week. And he's on his computer. He's, between every set, he's going, he's looking at the screen, he's typing something in, and he's thinking. Come on, y'all. He's thinking. What I got to do now, and, you know, I've learned something. I hope he don't watch this. I've learned on days that I'm really not in the mood to get really smacked, to struggle a little bit with the weight. Because <laughs> if I do it too easy, <laughs> I already know. If I, he said, oh, you, uh, you, oh, 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 it's like that, huh? Okay. Oh. Uh. So I've learned, right? <laughs> some days just don't, don't pay to show off some days. So, some days I'm going to go for it. But some days <laughs> it don't pay to show off because there's a consequence to showing off. It's a good consequence. I'm going to take you to the next level. So don't show off unless you're ready to go. But that's a process. And that process is putting more weight on you so that you can endure it. Again, we're not talking about disease and cancer and sickness and that's the, that's the devil. 
But if you are a person is in need of people liking you, God will surround you with a bunch of people that don't like you. That ain't designed to break you. Designed to make you be strong enough to stand whether people like you or not. If you depended all the time on your job, God will let it get hard on your job. You turn that boss into Jesus, God will show you he's not. God said, I gave you that person to be a blessing to you and now you put them in my place. They're going to get a promotion and you're going to get a new person. He ain't going to like you so much. But it develops character if you let it. You'll quit the gym, leave your membership behind everything. But you got to go through that. So, yes, there are trials, but not evil. But strength building, character building, endurance building. That will happen. So if you ever want to believe that pastor been saying, no, I don't believe in suffering, you just float through life, just pray, and God's going to make everything easy for you. If that's what you believe that I said, I'm clearing it up today. God will spank that hiney. But it's what it takes to get you in line. It's not to punish you because I'm mad at you and I hate you and I'm bitter and I'm disgusted. Oh, you shamed me. You embarrassed me before. No, 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 no. It's never like that. I know my trainer's never trying to hurt me. But I told him I want something. I look at him and I say, I want to look like you. You sure? Yeah. All right, we're going to make that happen. So here's what we're going to do. And I show up expecting just to do some squats and, and, and leg extensions. And he say, no, we're going outside today. Oh, God, I hate when he say we're going outside. <laughs> I hate when he says that because I already know what that means. I know what that means. You're going to put 345 plates in that tire and you're going to strap it to me. and You're going to make me run and drag it around the building. I already know what you're going to do. But then I get excited about it because I understand what it's going to do. And at the end of it, it's funny, he had me do this thing where he got these plates and he puts it on this thing on a sled on the floor. And I got to get down on my hands on it and like, so you're in push-up position kind of, and you got to push this thing across the floor. So it's like standing up and pulling it, I got used to that. So then he took the, the jacket off and said, now get down on the floor and push it. Are you getting the picture of what I'm describing? So, so if, in case you're not, 345 plates on this metal sled, and I got to be down on it like this and run it across the floor back and forth two or three times. The length of there and back and there and back and there and back. This is after I've already done squats and 24 lunges. And the last time... I, did, I mean, I got it. I'm like, yeah, I can catch my breath a little bit on the sled. I've learned, I learned how to position my body where I can let my weight just kind of lean forward on it and push it. So after the squats and stuff, I'm kind of looking forward to that because I catch a breather. And I walk in this day, and he drops another 45 plate on there. And I tried to get down on the floor and push it, and my little body weight on it didn't move it. I had to dig in with the legs now and do something. And after I did that third and final set, that carpet on that gym is disgusting. I don't like my legs to touch. I wear gloves all the time. You know, I'm a germaphobe kind of anyway. I rolled over on that floor and thank God for that floor at the end of that set. <laughs> I was grateful for that carpet because everything in me was, <laughs> everything in me was aching. But... <laughs> you can kick out of that. But that process is motivated and fueled in me to endure by the hope or the picture or the image that I have in me to look like him. Think that I'm having faith, I'm going to the gym. What you going to do? I'm just going to have faith and believe God to get me through my workout. Every day. For what? 
It won't last if you don't have a hope. Your faith won't stay attached if you don't have a hope. I got you now, right? Did that bring it home? That image, every time my legs want to give up and stop, I think about that picture of him that I have in my phone. And I go, if this is what gets me there, come on, legs, let's make it happen. You understand? And the motivation, the motivation is in that hope. So if trials develop character which produces hope that doesn't make you ashamed, means you will get the results you set out for, then we have to anchor ourselves. So I start to ask people in church, what are you believing for? I just believe for a new job, Pastor. That's it? So that's your hope? New car, new apartment, some new furniture. Really? That's it? So basically all Satan got to do to mess up your whole drive is give you that one, let you get that one thing easy? And then you got nothing? You ever got a job and that hated it? Got tired of it real quick? Because you wanted a job. Some of you are going to catch that later. You wanted a job. You didn't define a future. You don't have a hope in it. A job for what? So I could pay my bills. That's it? You're going to faint quick. You're going to faint quick. Because your destination is too easy to reach. You ain't got much. No, then when I get the job, I'm going to want to raise. How much raise? Another $5 an hour? That won't keep you motivated. Guarantee you the price of food is going to go up faster than you get that $5 raise. <laughs> are, are you kidding me? All they got to do is change the bus fare next, next year or two, and that, boom, that raise is shot. What's, what are we anchored to, men and women of God? What, what are we anchored to? What, 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 what are we fastening our faith to? When we go before the Lord in faith, what are, what are we b- hoping for, really? You know, Pastor, it seems like the things I don't think about come to pass faster than the things. Yeah, because those things have taken a God-like place. And probably the worst thing in the world could happen for you for that thing to manifest quickly. Because you've decided that your, your satisfaction is in this one move, this one event. Am I, am I getting too deep? Hmm. I hope I'm encouraging you. So let's finish with this. Let's, let's bring this home. So... You have to ask in faith, can't be dubious, can't hesitate and doubt. And it says, that person will receive nothing from the Lord, right? Let that person believe he receive anything from the Lord, right? Why? He's two men of two minds, and go ahead. Dubious, irresolute, double-minded, unstable, and uncertain about everything he thinks. So, There's a reason that you're not receiving anything from the Lord. And I want you to hear this real close. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about this person. (laughs) I want you to look about this. You're not resolved about anything. And and, and a couple of words it states here in, 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 in number eight that I really want you to look at. For he is a man of two minds. We got that. But it goes into it. Hesitating. Dubious. Irresolute, I just went through that thoroughly, unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything he thinks, feels, or decides. 
You can't make a decision if you want it or if you don't. If you believe, if it's not, if it's God or maybe it ain't. I believe it's the will of God. Maybe I wasn't God's will after all. You can't make a decision about nothing. He said, but let that person not believe he receives anything from the Lord. Now, I need to bring this home and I need to make this clear because this is a really strong thing. That a really strong confusion I have for a long time. And I'm sure when I said you go, yeah, I kind of was thinking that too. So here's what I thought. You listening? You listening? You listening? And if I'm right, if you have thought the same way, I just want you to wave a hand at me. Here's what I thought. So if I lack faith and I'm double minded, I piss God off and he ain't giving me nothing. Get on God's nerves. Right. That's not what it's saying. That's not what it's saying, though. And that's what I had to really come clear with. Watch this. Maybe don't piss him off, but because I don't have faith, God just won't give me nothing. Right? Okay, that one, more people, more takers on that one? No, it's not, it's not gold star versus you get no star because you, ain't, you wasn't a good boy or a good girl today. It's not what it's about. He's saying if you believe to receive anything from the kingdom with your line of faith, which comes from God, then this is the currency of exchange. And if you lack that, you can't receive anything from the Lord. It's not a punishment. Did I, did I get you clear yet or no? A little more? A little more? Mike, you, I'm going to use your hat. This is your hat. You, you didn't steal this, right? You bought this hat, right? And you walk in the store and you put food stamps down and the man gave you the hat. No, he didn't take no food stamp. Okay, you, you, you penny jar and you dumped it on the counter. No, okay, what did you use? You used $10. That man wanted that $10, right? And, you, and, and he, it wasn't Canadian currency, right? It wasn't African euros from, no, it, it was U.S. dollars, right? And in that store, that was his currency of exchange. It had nothing to do with how he felt about you personally. He may have liked you very much. He may have thought the hat looked better on you than any man that came in that store. But there was a method of exchange that you had to meet to get this hat. Did you get it now? When he's saying without faith, you won't get anything from the Lord. He's not saying because I'm going to be upset and I'm not going to give you nothing. He's saying the currency of exchange in here to fill your hope tank is you pay with the token of faith. And without that, you can't buy here. Your money's not good here. Crying don't get it. Weeping don't get it. Feeling sorry for yourself don't get it. What gets it is the currency of faith. Are right, we clear now? It's not a punishment. You're double-minded. You can't make up your mind what you're doing. You don't have faith in this store only accepts faith. I love that because that means whether you super educated or uneducated, whether you're black, white, green, or blue, God said, I don't care where you come from, rich family, poor family. In this store, we accept the currency of faith. Well, you don't have to be educated to have that. You need to be biblically educated, but you don't have to have five master degrees. You, you could be in the poorest country or the richest country. That currency still works. Still works. Still works. Still works. Well, but, you know, Pastor, I, I received that. I got that. But still, it's still saying I got to go through suffering and I got to go through some hardships. So it's still kind of saying there that God puts you through things, doesn't it? Well, if you want to take things out of concept, you can. But let's keep it in concept. Because we see he's talking about trials and suffering even when he goes to the faith thing that you have to have faith. He's saying, listen, you got to go through this and let it have a perfect work. You'll be perfect in time, lacking nothing. Then he said, if you lack wisdom, that's not a subject change. He's telling you, if you don't know how to do this, ask me and I'll tell you. 
but ask confidently that I'll give it to you. So now, <laughs> you're listening? So in this example, my hope needs to be anchored in the fact that when I ask God this question, he will give me all the wisdom I need. Well, you know, the Lord, you know, you never know. The Lord, we're going to, he'll show you in time. Well, see, you double-minded. You're waving. That's why you're not getting no answers. This, this subject right here is clearly about the wisdom to understand what he just explained. How many of you can say, I believe without a doubt in my mind and spirit that no matter what my situation is, if I ask God for wisdom in it, he will give it to me and guide me through. Right now, today, this very moment, that's where you need to be then. And if that isn't as solid as it should be, if it's more a statement than a truth, then you got work to do right there. That's what you need to understand, that your batting stance is wrong and your position ain't right. Because I need to know, for me, I ain't even put my hand up because I've come to the realization, God, there are certain places I totally expect you to give me wisdom in immediately. But then these, these other areas I go like, well, Maybe it's something I need to learn. I'm like, wait a minute. I don't even believe that. Why am I even thinking that junk? Right? So I'm honest to say, not in everything. Not in everything. But in those things, I'm saying, God, give me the confidence. Teach me what I need to do to learn that you will answer me here regardless. And he said, he said something really interesting. The Lord spoke something really into my spirit. Something I heard Steve Harvey say. When I step out into new areas like this that, that takes me out of my comfort zone, it's fearful. You know, even though you don't want to admit it, you still think, what if God don't show up? What if I take this move and take this chance and then God don't do nothing? Am I, am I lying here? Right? And I said... And he just reminded me of this, this line I heard Steve Harvey said. Steve Harvey was talking about stage fright, how he's petrified every time he has to go on stage. And the person said, how do you overcome that? He said, with another fear, a fear of being broke. And the fear of being broke <laughs> overcomes the fear of stage right? and I go on stage. Okay? So, <laughs> you know, so I, I, when God reminded me of that, I said, that's it. The fear of stepping out is superseded by the fear of not ever receiving anything from the Lord. So I'll step out. I'll believe. Now watch this. Verse 12. Blessed, happy, fortunate to be envied is the man who is patient under trials and stands up under temptation. So we know he never left the subject. Down to the 12th verse. For when he stood the test and is approved... He will receive the victor's crown of life, which has been promised to those who love him. You, did you hear this again? Goes back to it. Watch this. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. Well, it just, gave, it just described temptation and trial as a good thing. Then it just turned around and said, it ain't of God. There's a different explanation. He's talking about the trials that develop your faith. But he said, watch this, he'll explain it. For God is incapable of being tempted by what is evil, and he himself tempts no one. So he's saying, any evil temptation, anything that's put in your life to bring you harm, that's not God. Education test? Yes. How do you know the difference? If anyone lack wisdom, let him ask God. Something come in my life, I need to sit back and say, okay, God, is this you or is this the enemy trying to mess with me? Do I accept this or do I reject this? You some you just accept everything. You sign for every package that comes to the door. UPS send you a package and, and you can smell inside of it as manure and you still sign for it. Maybe God want me to smell something. <laughs> just say, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't receive that. Send that back to whoever it came from. That's not for me. 
Stop to make, the, make, the, make the, the, the carrier stand there and wait a minute. I need to pray and see if this is, Lord, is this you or not? You have a problem with that? You don't have to accept everything that comes to your door. You don't have to accept everything that comes in your life. You do need to ask. And I guarantee you a lot of us are signing for stuff that God didn't send. Maybe I'm, trying, I'm supposed to learn something. The fact that you got to say maybe means you ain't hearing from God. Then that area in your life needs to be fixed, doesn't it? But every person is tempted, talking about evil stuff now, when he is drawn away and enticed and baited by his own evil desires, lusts, and passions. Now, let's go back to man with, driven with the wind and toss and he can't get anything from God. He's described here then. This is a person who's drawn away and baited by whatever desire pops up. Fear, worry, distress, he just move by it. And that evil desire can seems it brings forth sin. And when sin is fully matured, it brings forth death. Let me say this to you. See how much time I got here? None. About a few seconds. I'm still going to say this, though. Let me say this to you. Notice this process. Drawn by your evil desires, lust. Conceive, sin. Conceives, death. Same process. Think about it. On the positive side, you got trials, endurance, character, hope, lust, evil, conceived sin, death. They both have outcomes, but the processes are both in place. So he's saying, keep flip-flopping around, being pushed around by your emotions and your lusts, and there's an outcome for that. Or stand with me and walk through the process of developing a solid hope. And then when your faith is there, you have a manifestation of godliness. It's not just stuff. It's my walk. It's my attitude. It's, it's me saying, God, I need godly character so that when the man across the street pushes me, I don't punch him in his mouth. But that was developed. I allow God to develop that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I allow God to walk me through enough rejection and insult over the past couple of years that that didn't push me over the edge. Now, let me end it with this note. Did you learn? Are you learning something? Verse 16. Look at somebody say, do not be misled. You understand what that means, right? So listen, I'm going to read it. Do not be misled, my beloved brethren. All in the same chapter. Every good and perfect gift. Free, large, and full gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of all that gives light in the shining of whom there can be no variation, re um, rising or setting, or shadow cast by him turning in an eclipse. Here's what he just said. Don't get it twisted. Let me put it in, 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 in street language. Don't get it twisted. I only give good stuff. That's what he said. Don't get it twisted. I don't bend to the left or the right. Well, you never know what the Lord got. He said, I don't change my ways. I'm a good God, and I give good gifts that come down from heaven. Stop calling the devil's work in your life me because it's not me. Don't get it twisted. I don't switch, switch in faith. I'm not double-minded like you and with, with the wave of the sea driven and irresolute and can't make up my mind. I'm God. I'm God and I'm good. Every good and perfect and full gift comes from me. And if it's anything other than that, you can sign for it if you want, but that's your problem. I had to make this decision, and this is where I wrap up. Maybe I screamed the mic broke. I had to make this decision. I've signed for a lot of junk that didn't come from the throne. Even knowing this, 
I still accepted a lot of packages that were not for me. So in this season, I've been praying that my hope be in a different place and my sensitivity to what God is doing in my life be in a different place that I don't sign for except junk that's not from the throne of God. And I believe we're all in that same place. And if you are, give me a hearty amen. 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 Give him praise.